do teach the African religions in the diaspora. Can you tell us a little bit about that class and about just the African religions in the diaspora? Well, <clears throat> um, one of my, my interests in, in, in the study of African religions in the diaspora came about while I was doing graduate work. I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Maduro and with Karen McCarthy Brown, who wrote the pretty famous book called Mama Lola Voodoo Priestess in Brooklyn. And I did quite a bit of research. I was studying Pentecostalism, but I also started looking into Santeria, Candomblé, Haitian Voodoo, in particular Spiritism. And I realized, like I had not before, because I was studying, I always had interest in race issues, race and racism. So I was studying race and racism, especially as it is found in Latin America. And um, in studying Santeria, Haitian Voodoo, Candomblé, I realized that those traditions have been demonized. And I started realizing that the demonization of these religion was not really based on theological issues. It was based on racial issues. Any, I started realizing that anything that's black or comes out of Africa uh, is demonized, is said not to be to par with other traditions. And um, I, I also saw, I, I saw how people looked at these traditions as primitive, you know, as exotic and primitive and ignorant to some extent. And as I delved into it, I realized that there was wisdom and knowledge in them that had been preserved from hundreds if not thousands of years back. And I, I also study a, a, a French sociologist called Pierre Bourdieu, and he helped me quite a bit in unraveling what was happening in terms of the rejection of these religions. I think it's based on racism and class. Uh, let me just give you a simple example that I tell my students every semester. So people see the use of a chicken as a sacrifice in some of the rituals that happen in, let's say, in Lukumi tradition. Lukumi is the real name. Santeria is the most, it's named after because uh, saints were created out of pieces of wood. Um, Santeria. So um, I tell my students, we think of it as primitive, you know, as bizarre, exotic. Some people want to study just so they could go see a chicken be sacrificed. However, on Sunday mornings, we have millions of people going to eat the body of a dead man and drink his blood. But we don't find that as bizarre in the United States because dominant religions, dominant ideologies are looked at as normal. I'd be quite honest with you, it's to me it seems more normal to sacrifice a chicken than to eat the body of a man we say died 2000 years ago. And we become even a little more bizarre in our thinking. We say that he rose again from the dead and then we drink his blood and we, we don't call ourselves vampires. So um, do you get what I'm saying? I'm not putting down Christianity either, but if you're gonna look at bizarreness, we probably fit really well into what's bizarre and maybe even psychotic. So I saw that where it lies, it, there's an issue of class, but it's racism, anything that's black. And in fact, I'll say this with some trepidation, I'm a little concerned that interreligious engagement and interfaith dialogue has not included African traditions enough into the dialogue. I have to ask myself why. Is it still some level of racism or classism in which we just see these as not worthy of study? So I am very, I, it's one of the courses that's my favorite course to teach. Because in everything I teach, Carmen, there's an underlying issue. It's an epistemological issue for me, which is, I don't say it out loud as one of the objectives, but there's an epistemological issue, which is how do we know what we think we know? 
How do we know what we think we know? Mm -hmm. And through this course, the students are able to do deconstruction, even if we don't name it, and critical analysis because they start realizing, wow, even as myself, as a black person, I was told that my ancestral traditions are diabolical and I accepted that. Wow. So it helps unravel a lot in terms of how racism works. In fact, the courses goes hand in hand. We discuss racism in almost every session on one level or another, because you have to deconstruct all those false images we've been given about our people and our traditions. I mean, don't you find it, it when you think about it, isn't it interesting that black religions are called demonic? So um, to me, it's a, it's a, I, I love teaching the course and introducing people, because I invite guest speakers of the different traditions, people full of wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge uh, to come and speak in the class to the students. As I stated to you last week also, uh, I think African religions probably are the most fruitful traditions if people took them seriously to do eco-theologies because there's more than respect for nature. It goes hand in hand. You can't separate the tradition from the earth. Thank you. Um, as you were talking, you mentioned race and you mentioned um, the African religions and the ties to Africa. Um, I think who better than Dr. Niang, who is from Senegal, uh, who lives here, um, but who is from there and who teaches New Testament, um, which is Christianity. Uh, so Dr. Niang, the, the big elephant in the room, is Christianity a white religion? Some people like to think so, but uh, I disagree uh, because if we really want to think about the idea of following Jesus, then we, we better think of Palestine because that's where the movement of Jesus started, right? Um, as far as I know, that movement went different ways and ended up in Europe, but also touched Africa in significant ways, which means from start, they were basically uh, a mixed group of African as well as um, Palestinian. And uh, by Palestinians, I'm meaning early followers of Jesus are being Jews. And so you have the book of Acts telling us about the story of Philip. And uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. So at the very beginning of the movement, you have this mixed group and Africa was very much part of that uh, experience. So to say it's a white person's religion, I will defer from that because of the origin of what we have called today Christianity. Now, so teaching the New Testament helped me understand that actually, um, if we want to be honest, that the early movement of Jesus has been inculturated in various contexts. So, for one context to claim Christianity would be very <laughs> dangerous to do. And, and that's exactly what some of it happened among some of the colonists who came to Africa. And um, some of the missionaries viewed Christianity that way, not realizing that the history of Christianity Africa was very much part of it. And I recall our last discussion that actually, if you mention Augustine, if you mention other, uh, especially Ethiopian Christianity, uh, and I mean, it has a long history in connection with the movement of Jesus. Now, 
Uh, to answer your question briefly, I would say no. So it's not a white person's religion now. Um, although we can explain in what way we can disagree, but I would say no simply uh, to say Christianity is enculturated by many cultural contexts in Palestine, in the Greco-Roman world, in Asia Minor, in Northern Egypt, or even the Coptic. Again, you begin to see that it's very dangerous to make that claim. So making that claim excludes uh, many people from the Christian experience. Thank you. Dr. Cruz, so then what is the importance if it is, as Dr. Niangas just said, it's not a white or an exclusive religion, then what is the role of the black church and the Latin X church? What do they play in this? I think uh, that, well, let me put it bluntly. I look at it quite often like this, you know, in, in, more recent days, times, there's been critiques, serious critiques of Christianity, and the critiques quite often are accurate. And it's uh, people are almost afraid to speak about their faith from a Christian perspective because Christianity has a long history of being a colonial religion. So people within the left or progressive liberal Christians are almost afraid to even mention the name Jesus. But I always say, that the Jesus of the white colonial imperialistic church is not the Jesus of the black and Latinx church. So some of that critical application does not necessarily fall to the black and Latinx church. Although, unfortunately, black and Latinx churches do have some of the negative vestiges of that Christianity because it was imposed upon us. I mean, Christianity came to most of us as a colonial enterprise, an oppressive enterprise. I mean, enslaved Africans were forcefully converted to Christianity. So were the indigenous uh, people of the Americas. So, um, but the, I, I really look at them as two separate churches or three, let's say. But keeping it within the rubric of churches of color, I think the churches of color and the white Christianity are separate churches. I don't even understand white Christianity quite often. I mean, I don't connect to it, I guess is what I mean, spiritually or intellectually. Um, because unfortunately, white Christianity, like everything that's white in this society is presented as the norm. And even our curriculums quite often present a normative white theological perspective. It's really profound um, to even think of it in that way. Um, I know that when I was taking church history, I often thought um, similarly that when people are saying that I am Christian, I'm thinking, which Christian are you? Are you the Christian in the New Testament where God you know, comes and delivers the land to all the people and conquered and you don't have to do anything? Or are you of the Jesus walk? Or are you, it felt like I almost wanted to ask a subset of questions when someone says, I'm a Christian. Um, but going to our roots, going back to there, uh, Dr. Niang, um, and I'm sorry, if you would just unmute there for a second, Dr. There we are. I wanted to ask you, You've taken a small delegation from Union. I was blessed to be able to go to Senegal. Um, and can you tell us more about that experience and how it ties to um, the connection, the, the visit to Gore Island, the, the being there on in the space, how that ties to it? Yes. Um, the trip to Senegal is to experience what I thought and still believe that 
will be a very much uh, good condition for union. And that is when we talk about, as Dr. Cruz mentioned, diaspora experiences of religion, specifically drawing on ancestral religion that we can trace back to the continent. So for me, that trip was to help us learn what it means to actually be in the continent first. Experience the people. Look at Gore, which is actually one of the uh, sites that should engender in every person rethinking and relearning about human atrocity in history. The slave trade. And that's why we're talking today about diaspora religion. If we look at the slave trade and the door no return at Gore, which is a chilling reminder that something atrocious happened in that site. And for someone who is of African descent, but born in the continent of Africa, it's a site that helps me not forget what had happened, which is the slave trade. Now, being in America, I, I am often, I mean, a chill runs through my body when I meet people of African descent in America who are born in America. Knowing from Senegal all the way to Angola, people were taken from the continent. They did not decide to come here as migrants. They were forced. And they came with their religion. <laughs> they came with their religion. In spite of the atrocities, something about that religion remained. But it did evolve because of the context. So the chill in me is, wow, I met a group of people of African descent. They are Americans. But the question is this, could one of them have been a member of my family back home? I live with that pain every day, not knowing this person I just met or didn't even greet and just pass. Could this person have been a member of my family uprooted sometimes by people who advocated the slave trade? That's one thing that I wanted us to at least get a feel during the trip. But also, I wanted us to experience the people. Hospitality. What does it mean to be a human being in Senegal? And what does it mean to be a Muslim in Senegal and a Christian in Senegal? Or an African traditionalist. But I wanted you also and myself to revisit that location where a father could be a Muslim and a mother a Catholic. And then the children traditionalists. That's 
what I thought is a robust inter-religious experience. And Dr. Cruz, if you disagree, let me know. The embodiment of what it means to actually have a household that manifests what it means to be inter-religious. Many people have different definitions of it, but my definition of it is this. Just look at a, a household where you have a Christian, a Muslim, and a, a traditionalist, but guess what? They enjoy the holidays together. That's fascinating to me. That's what I wanted us to experience. And then we come back at the union. Since we are already doing inter-religious engagement, and I hear what Dr. Cruz just said, maybe this will help us continue to cultivate what definitions we might want to actually tell people beyond the union, here is who we are. And uh, the trip, thank God that this trip will allow us to not just have exchange students, exchange faculty, we can go actually to Africa, Senegal and do some perhaps two weeks of, uh, um, of discussions with students and profs, but also we can visit healers. We can visit traditionalists. When we begin to hear them speak that they are Muslims, but they do traditional dimension of healing. Mm -hmm. That's quite something, right? Yeah. And then we also, they can come over here to show us then what it means to be a Sufi in Senegal. Mm. What does it mean to be a Christian in Senegal? How does a Sufi relate to Christians? And that's what we experienced when we were in Senegal and the connection we are actually uh, trying to cultivate is that the group we met had the same concerns or let me say this, similar concerns with those concerns we have here. And that is justice, gender issues, and ultimately liberation. Hmm. Yeah. The liberation which requires that we act justly. Whether we want it or not, we have to practice it. So Dr. Cruz, likewise, you took a delegation to Puerto Rico. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, I, 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 there were several reasons, I guess, although we never sometimes flesh it out that way. When you're doing a trip, you say, we're going here to, to be in one of the, uh, areas in the island where most afro puerto ricans live i don't like the term but i'm using it for this because you're puerto rican you're puerto rican why do you have to say i'm a black puerto rican right and so where most black puerto ricans live so we went there because a friend uh an activist scholar malta moreno vega who's been advocating for racial justice for the last 50 years in new york city uh, she's the founder and director of the Afro-Caribbean Cultural Center on 125th Street in Harlem. She has a project going out there in Puerto Rico. And so there were multiple reasons why I wanted to go there. One was so people could experience the, uh, uh, the African religions as, uh, as they developed there. But I think primarily my goal was to show that um, there's a misconception that, and I don't mean this as a negative critique, but there's a misconception that the only people of African descent in the United States are African-Americans. And 
I mean, that it's that's problematic on several levels. One of the reasons that misconception is there, because there's a history of racism in Latin America. But uh, I wanted also to show the students that uh, there are 150 million people of African descent in Latin America and the Caribbean. There are actually more black people in Latin America and the Caribbean than they are in the United States. Brazil is the second largest black country in the world, and it's not in Africa, you know? And uh, so that was uh, one of my goals to, to, to ex ex explore slavery, but also in Puerto Rico, since blackness has been denied, like in most Latin American countries, nobody thinks of the slave trade. I mean, many more slaves were brought to Brazil and Cuba than were to the United States and to the Dominican Republic. Interestingly enough, Puerto Rico received the fewest number of slaves and it wasn't coincidental. It was a policy stated by Spain because they were afraid of the revolutions that were taking place in Latin America. They said, don't send any more black slaves to Puerto Rico. We can't afford to have a revolution going on there too. So they received a fewer number of, of black slaves, but there's an individual who wrote a book, El País de Cuatro Piso, The Country of Four Floors. And he talks about the different cultures that influenced the makeup of Puerto Rican people. And he concluded, and I agree with his thesis, that the culture that's most prominent in Puerto Rico is the black culture, African culture. He basically ended up saying, we eat black, we dance black, and we do spirituality black, you know? So, but people try to deny their blackness. There's a history for the denial. Uh, I don't want to get into it now, but from the independence movements of the na new nation states in the 19th century, they wanted to emulate the United States. So they copied their pseudo uh, racist uh, ideas, you know, pseudo scientific racist ideas. They wanted to be prosperous countries. So they had to decide that blacks are inferior, although it had to be modified because the overwhelming majority of people in Latin America are either black or mulatto. So you would have to eliminate the whole society basically. Um, but you can see the history of racism in Brazil, majority black, all the, all the people who ruled the place are white. So there were multiple issues. Also the issue that Neon mentioned, multiple what we call multiple religious affiliations. People um, have had multiple religious affiliation, but if I would say, I guess I could say that these multiple religious affiliations are more natural in nature, they happen. It's not an intellectual endeavor for them or, or uh, an idea that has been created to create dialogue about it and even theological books and discourses. It happens naturally. And the, the engagement that happens, happens more naturally. And you're almost forced into the engagement in a, in a better way. Let me just give you a quick example. I don't wanna to take too much time, but I met an Indian, a person of Asian Indian theologian, Pentecostal, conservative. Okay, theologically conservative, but he said he was more open into interreligious engagement. And he said, I was more open to it because I grew up in India as a Christian, but all my friends were Muslims. So I had spiritual and psychological dissonance. Were my best friends going to hell? People I love going to hell? And I said to myself, that's so interesting because same experience for me. I was Pentecostal, very strict, only Christians get saved. My grandmother was Catholic and Spiritist. And for us, Pentecostalism, Spiritism was diabolical. That's demonic. I was almost afraid to go to her apartment. But I loved my grandmother. Of course. And I couldn't conceive that my grandmother was going to hell. So I had to from a humanity perspective, from the, human the, the humanness in me, I had to come to 
do hermeneutics. I had to start interpreting my Christian faith in a different way so that I could understand that my beloved grandmother was not destined to hell as white dominant Christianity had proposed at one point because she was practicing the traditions of her ancestors. So that I think interreligious engagement has a lot to learn from what people on the margins as society have had to negotiate their traditions. You've educated and enlightened and enriched me uh, as you do every time I talk to either of you. So thank you uh, to our listeners. I encourage you, bless yourself, do yourself a favor, uh, start on the right foot, sign up for these classes. This has been another edition of Inside Admissions. I'm Carmen Michael Smith. Thank you. Thank you.